All right, Eric, it's so good to have you today. I'm really looking forward to everybody being able to hear your message because it's one that I don't think is getting out enough. A lot of us have heard of like sustainable and organic and those words are becoming more commonplace. Um, and there's such a push right now for like um, the plant-based movement and like, you know, that cattle are ruining the earth and all of these things. And then you come in with this message of regenerative regenerative agriculture. And I'm wondering if you can just on a basic level, because I know educating on this is part of what you do. Um, t- could you teach us what regenerative agriculture is and why it's important for our planet? Yes, absolutely. And um, thank you for having me on, by the way, too. And yeah. the fact that folks like yourself are talking about it are just like, this is something I've been living my whole life. And mm. like, it never, never got any traction whatsoever. Mm. But, you know, here lately, just within the last, you know, few years, you know, folks like yourself and other influencers and, and politicians and everybody is using this term now. And it's like, <laughs> this is so energizing for me, for somebody <laughs> who's lived this for so long. And knowing how important it is, and then finally it's getting the recognition that it deserves. Um, So, yeah, just really thrilled to be here. And and thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah, but but regenerative in the in the most basic sense is just, um, you know, when you think of that term, it's just renewal. Right. So, you know, in in nature, there's there's life, death, decay and then renewal. That's just how nature works. And so regenerative is just that's that very thing. And, and in terms of agriculture, it's just the ability to build soil health over time. So to build topsoil. Um, and so when you think about it, our, our planet is just one big rock covered with a tiny layer of topsoil and subsoil. And that's what sustains everything we do. You know, every economy, every nation is sustained on by this you know, very small layer of topsoil. And what we've had through conventional agriculture methods is is depleting this over over the last you know many decades, and we're we're at a point now where we're losing about 75 billion tons of topsoil every year, and so clearly this is not like you said sustainable at all, but it's definitely not regenerative, and so that's why you know I see these things happening day in and day out, and, and it just breaks my heart, but. Um, I think there is definitely a solution with regenerative agriculture. And in terms of, of how I'm using that, there's different different forms of that. It can be, you know, in how you manage your cropland, you know, that you try not to plow and you plant these diverse crop mixes and cover crops and incorporate animals in it. And what I'm doing myself is just utilizing cattle to regenerate grasslands and then regenerate soil health. And it really comes down to a management issue as I think with most things, it's like, you know, it's how we manage things that makes the difference. And for cattle in general, which is kind of my expertise, it's just how you manage these animals. So you can either, you know, you can have a positive impact on land or you can have a negative impact. And it's all how you manage these animals. And all we're, all we're doing in a sense is trying to mimic nature. And what I mean by that is, when we think back about how our, our grasslands evolved over time, it was through the use of, of, of large ruminants such as bison, which kind of roamed North America in herds by the tens of millions. And those giant herds roamed across the prairies and they basically, you know, they just kept moving. They stayed in fairly tight herds because they were under the threat of, of many predators back then. And they kept moving. They kept moving across that prairie, grazing it off putting their dung and urine back in the soil and then moving on and then letting those plants recover and regenerate. And so that's all we're trying to do with cattle since we've put up all these barriers on, on, on the grasslands through fences and roads and, and we've fenced everything in and we've taken away all the predators. You know, we've, we've allowed a system that can't mimic those natural behaviors. So we have to take that on ourselves. And so that's what I'm trying to do with our, our cattle herds to mimic that natural behavior. And that's just kind of how you regenerate the, those lands. And um, the, the, you know, the, the other uh, option to that is how most ranchers do this is basically set stocking cattle, letting them graze as they want to. And they'll go and graze their favorite grasses and then leave. And then that grass will start to recover. And then they'll come back and graze it again. And then that just eventually over a few sessions of that, it kills that particular grass. And that's replaced with a less desirable grass that they don't eat. And so this is 
where we start to see a lot of degradation across our our, our, our lands, our, our grasslands, where there's just improper management. It really just comes down to a management issue. Yeah, and I'm so fascinated by, you were sharing with me when um, I we met at a conference, you were sharing with me how you do this, how you, can you share with the audience how you see how to move the cattle? What Because you're integrating technology with this too in a really fascinating way to be able to know when to move the cattle along so that we don't lose the grass entirely. Can you share that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, just a little background on myself. Um, I, I grew up on, on a cattle ranch, um, uh, a small ranch, and my dad was kind of one of those guys who was really, you know, I had to learn every name of every blade of grass that was on our property, and I had to understand and appreciate that. So I had a, a really good appreciation from that as a young age, um, and I watched a lot of the other ranchers around me kind of not pay attention to these things and, and really saw some degrading landscapes, and I really got depressed with cattle in general, I was like, ah, well, I, I really don't, you know, think this is the, the right way forward. But as I started learning more in, in how this movement was growing, it really energized me to, you know, plan mm-hmm. to do things differently. But to get to your, your point where how we manage our animals is basically, uh, you can do it a number of ways. So it can be with electric fencing, um, and you're just moving that fencing every few days and you're, you're kind of evaluating where that piece of land is at and then monitoring that. And there's lots of technology now today to help us do that. Um, we're kind of at a point in time in history where there's this uh, convergence of, of, you know, old school uh, of, of mimicking nature of, of ways mm-hmm. and then combining that with technology to help us better yes. understand its effects. And so... We're doing a number of things with, you know, drone technology and, and automation to help us mimic these natural behaviors. And so um, uh, we, we basically, when we set a, a group of cattle on a pasture, we'll watch that. We'll monitor it with uh, uh, satellite data and drone technology and get some feedback from that. And then when that looks like it's had enough impact, then we move it a day or two later. We move to the next section and then we just keep following that pattern. And we don't ever come back until we realize we actually know that grass is recovered enough to come back and graze again. Yeah, so beautiful. And I love this. And I'm all about this. This is exactly what I preach from a health coach standpoint is how can we mimic nature, but also using these cool modern day tools that we have. So we're doing we're doing the same things because it's like we're not going back. We're not going to go backwards. We're not going to go live in the wild like that's not going to happen. But we know that there's so many elements of that that are what keep us sustainable or regenerative, right? Because if we can't do that, if we can't somehow figure out a way to get sunlight in every day and get good clean air and good oxygen and dirt blown in our faces or some sort of minerals put in, like we're all going to suffer in the long run because we are nature. You know, our bodies are nature. (laughs) Sometimes I like to say we're, these are rented to us. (laughs) These are part of nature. You know, we're inhabiting nature. (laughs) Um, And so like what I love that you guys are doing that is saying you're, we're moving forward. We're saying, now this is really exciting because as we're able to understand that and mimic nature, but we have all these advanced tools, now what's possible? This could possibly be the best the earth has ever been yes. if we can manage it, as you say, well. Yes, that's such a great insight, Tara, that you just said. Um, and, you know, what us having all these additional tools can really make the difference. Um, because, you know, when we think about and basically, when we think about um, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the age of machines, we basically have tried to tame nature every step of yep. the way. Yeah. And the problem with that is it's a what what we call it kind of a reductionist approach to things. So uh, w- when something breaks, you know, we reduce it down to that individual part and we fix it. So that's kind of a, a what we'd call mm-hmm. a complicated system, whether it's a machine or and we, it, similar to a machine, it's how you apply right. that to agriculture as well. And so what I mean by that is like, you know, when when you plant all these crops and you have one certain insect attacks that crop, well, it's easy. We reduce it down. OK, we figured out this insect. We apply this pesticide. It'll kill the insect. Voila, we're done. You know, and so we've reduced right. down to that one individual thing. The problem with that is we don't think about all the other holes that it's that it it hurts. So number one being soil health, and so 
this whole mindset shift in regenerative is this holistic approach, this holistic thinking that you take into account that everything you do uh, creates some other, you know, either net benefit or net drain on your on on the planet or soil health or anything. So it's really trying to think of this holistic uh, approach to things and thinking what we do when we do something, what effect is it going to have on the other thing? So it's it's the difference mm-hmm. between you know complicated system and when we're talking about biology, a very complex system. There's so many things that figure out in a biological sense that we don't always think of when we reduce it down to one individual piece. So yeah, I love it. We're we're doing we're on the same mission, you know, with the body. If you're if you're really taking a holistic look at the body, you can't help but have a holistic look at the planet and vice versa. I'm sure this is how you approach your health. I know you're a CrossFit a- athlete and into the paleo yes. world. And that's actually where we met was at paleo effects because, and I want to talk about, I want to talk about rep provisions. I want to talk about <laughs> your company because a lot of my, you know, people who follow me on Instagram, they may see me talking about rep provisions, how they provide these grass fed beef sticks in this pecan nut butter. But I'm like, you guys don't understand one. You don't understand how good they taste. Cause you guys were definitely the bell of the ball at paleo effects last year. Um, but also like what they're supporting. Supporting. I'm like, you, do, you need to understand what you're supporting. And that's part of the reason I wanted to have you on the podcast today, because I'm such a firm believer that our our dollar is the biggest vote that we have. I don't get too involved in politics because I'm like, man, I have so little power there. It's not even funny. But the way I spend my money, there's a lot of power there, a lot. And every single time I spend my money on something, on an animal that was raised well, or you know, some farmer or somebody who raised their crops with care and love and did it the more expensive and hard way, when I pay for that, I say, I vote for that. I'm voting for you, you know? And so that's, that's what I, that's what you guys are doing is like, maybe, um, could you share with them? Like, I was like, why did you do pecan nut butter? Can you share that with them? It's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Why'd you choose yeah, pecans? Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so basically I, I have a ranch here in Oklahoma and we raise cattle and on this ranch, we also have about a thousand pecan trees. And so I was just, just looking out as this kind of process started to develop and rep, provisions was kind of born this was a, a, a an avenue for us to help you know bring regenerative to the public and like you said allow that consumer to vote with its dollar but you know for me personally I just kind of I was thinking well what kind of products can we develop and I just thought well what do we have available to us so I looked out my window you know at, at my house and I well I've got pecans and I've got grass-fed beef I said let's let's just roll with that that's what we have you know that's yeah. what we have available yeah. so so that's what we started with um, and we uh, we are, we are now going to be unveiling um, next week a num- a big line of fresh products as well. Mm-hmm. So we're excited about that. That's coming very soon. And it, and also we have aligned with a a group a uh, called the Savory Institute out of Boulder, Colorado, who they're a, a a not-for-profit organization that is is working with farmers and ranchers for the restoration of grasslands. So they do a certification called EOV, which we're putting on on our products that, you know, certifies for the consumer so they can vote with their dollar and they say, hey, we know these folks are doing it right. We know they're building soil health over time. Mm. We know that the soil that they grow their food in is more nutrient dense than what I potentially can get at any grocery store. So I think it's important, you know, for our health, your health and everybody that, that, that soil health is the best it could possibly be. A hundred percent. And I was just asking you when we were emailing back and forth, I was like, do you know, Dr. Zach Bush? I'm assuming, you know, who Dr. Zach is. You're like, yeah, we do. And he was just on, on my Instagram. And I mean, I have never had so many requests for like, where is the replay girl? Where's I'm like, I'm trying to edit it guys. I'm trying, (laughs) I'm having problems, but, um, yeah. So, I mean, he's Dr. Zach is such a huge proponent of this and it's just been such a paradigm shifter. He really is a, a hero. And I, I perceive you, exactly the same way because this is it's a labor of love it's a labor of love it's like you could take the easy way out and it's like no I'm actually going to change the world we're actually going to help heal the world and um, I love I love hold on two things one I love that you use the resources at that were around you, which is like so beautiful. It's exactly you're walking the walk of what is being taught here. You know, it's like to use what's locally available to you to um, appreciate that, to have gratitude for that, not looking outside of ourselves for something bigger and better, but to recognize the beauty of what we have around us and how that can be a gift to bring to the world. And then the other thing is this EOV certification. So what does that stand for? So EOV is um, Savory Institute's uh, brand called Ecological Outcome Verification. 
And it's basically, they are measuring our land. Every year it's measured. And that's measured through uh, soil tests. It's measured through the biodiversity of the plant and that life that's on that, that's growing on that land. And you have to, you have to, you know, catalog that every year and show that it's improving over time. Wow. And so they have a huge database. They keep all this data there. And as long as you're improving over time, then you stay in that program. Um, and it's not, you know, it's and, and, and simply improving over time is just following some simple processes like we talked about earlier, where we're just kind of mimicking these natural behaviors, paying attention to your land, paying attention to your, how your animals are impacting it. And it's not a difficult thing to do. It's just it's kind of a it's a paradigm shift for most ranchers to to bring this up. You know, it's more kind of this hippy dippy woo hoo hoo kind of thing, you know, that they don't want to hear about. I've done this my whole life. And um, and there's a number of ranchers that are have been doing it right their whole life, but they're not getting differentiated in the marketplace. And so I've been reaching out to local folks around my area that I know have been doing it right and say, hey, man, I we we think we can get you on this product and, 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 you know, get a premium for your beef and, and right. And lately, as I don't know if you've paid attention to the markets lately on, on animal products, but it's been kind of a disaster. So they're very eager to listen right now. So right now is a prime time to get these farmers and ranchers to shift their practices. And I've just seen there's some underlying things happening that I just have a ton of confidence that this is going to be a big shift. Oh, amazing. Uh, ranching as well. That's that's so good to hear because it feels you know you I think we can all feel like this global consciousness that's raising right now like this awakening yes. that's happening so hearing that that's happening because that's that's key you know we look at these problems in the the food industry and I, I think Dr Zach referred to it as like the Holocaust of animals right now is like basically what we've been going through the way our yes. food industry has turned yes. um, and so to hear like that the farmer that the ranchers actually when they have those shifts when they choose to stand up and say hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going to do something different. Like that's huge. That's such yeah. good news to hear that. Um, yeah. On the EOV label, I just want to clarify too, for my own understanding and for my audience, is that also, is it on animal products and um, crops or just one or the yes. other? So if you, if you grow crops that have been baselined, um, they're still kind of working on some of the um, more complicated um, um, uh, pieces that go along with cropland. But for example, I have pecans. Um, that I grow on my land. If, you know, if we sell those through that, that would be as part of an EOV product. Um, they're working diligently to get other types of crops um, incorporated in that, that we grow for food. And, and that would ju just basically be those crops that may just be there for a short time. That basically that land is not plowed. It has a cover crop and it has animals rotate across that. So mm -hmm. Uh, they're still they're still working on getting you know some of those bigger just core crop lands incorporated in the EOV program, but um, I think you'll see more and more uh, products coming online sooner um, in the next you know year that that have those type of crops that we grow for food that would be listed as EOV. Uh, also, I think there may be I don't know maybe a dozen brands is all right now that have EOV. Some of them um, are are fashion, some of them are food, some of them are dog food, but. There's, mm. there's not a ton right now, but it's, it's a building a lot of momentum and it takes, you know, consumers being educated about why it's critical. And so they can vote with their dollar. Yeah, I'm really happy to hear that because I've like, sometimes it's difficult for me as a health coach to tell people there's not like a clear cut. People are like, you know, they know organic and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, but there's like, you know, with animals, especially I'm like, you got to look and see if it says like small family farms yeah, and absolutely. pasture raised. And it's like, it's kind of hard to find what you're looking for. So that I'm glad to hear that that's happening. And I hope it does continue to build because it's like, oh, those are my people. That's what, yes. <laughs> yeah. that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear that's coming. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, just to that point though, you know, organics, good locals, better yeah. regenerative best, but any of those things, you know, especially local, I mean, man, please, you know, encourage folks to, to purchase that every time they can. Um, or, or farmer, you know, people who you know where your food came from. If it says, you know, this came from this farm, you know, more than likely they've probably done it right, you know. And, and understand, you know, there's there's plenty of education out there from these these farmers and ranchers that are, are you know, telling their story and selling their food. And so you can kind of get an idea of where it's coming from and how it's been handled. 
Yeah. And buying locally, I think sometimes people can feel overwhelmed by that. They're like, how do I do it? I got to go find a farm somewhere or what? And it's like, it's really not that overwhelming. Like one for one, at least here in Utah, where I live, there's a, there's a chain called Harmon's grocery store where they sell a lot of local products right at the grocery store. So you can just, they have a local tag all over the place on the, and it tells you right from where in Utah it's coming from, you know, I'm like, well, that's right down the street, you know, or going to a farmer's market with your kids on a Saturday is really fun. You know, like get them into it, have an activity or yeah. Yes, like even some of the farms even around here, they're not that far. They're down the street. Like um, we once had a situation where one friend would take a turn going and getting raw milk and meat and stuff for everybody. And we just revolve around that way. So it's really not it's really not that hard. And it's so much better for you because think about how our gut microbiomes are all ready for the food that's coming from our area. Like I really truly believe that mother nature gifts us with the things that we need based off the location that we're in. So it's really such a, it's such an investment in yourself, you know, to, to make that tiny, tiny bit of effort. And it's pretty fun too. Yeah. Yeah. I love that term that Zach Bush is a breathe your biome. I mean, that's, that's so true, you know, and that's, that's what we do every day here and and dig in the dirt and get dirty and, Yes. Just, you know, become a part of, of that natural process. Yeah. yeah. So a little, little secret. <laughs> I hope I'm allowed to tell this on a podcast, but um, a, a friend of mine works for Dr. Zach and that's how I was able to interview him. She okay. connected us. And um, when I go hiking in the mountains here in Utah, I mean, I'm just like, I literally like just rub the dirt. Cause it's just this deep, dark soil straight in the mountains. And I, I just yeah. rub that stuff on my skin. Cause I'm like, I know oh, I need yeah. some of these minerals, <laughs> this mineral rich Utah. I'm walking in the water. And she told me that he does that. I was like, that is my people. That is That's, amazing. You know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can't say enough yeah. about that. I want to get into the butterflies. Can we talk yes. about the butterflies? This is so cool. Please tell them about the butterfly. First of all, just knowing like most people probably have no idea about the migration. <laughs> so yeah, the yeah. So fill us no, in. Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. So um, again, like, you know, the, these pollinators, these species um, that help kind of pollinate a lot of our crops. Um, I, I don't know, you know, if folks are paying attention. There's a, been a big decline in a lot of these species from honeybees um, to, to many insects. But The monarch butterfly is just one of those like iconic butterflies that I I don't know about you, but I grew up watching this as a kid so many times. And it was just it was fascinating to learn about this this particular butterfly. Um, And it's it basically makes a migration um, from a one spot in Mexico in a forest. And I mean, this is tiny. It's like, you know, a few acres of fir trees that they they hibernate in all winter. And then when, when it becomes spring and around March, April, they start this migration all the way north, up through North America, all the way to Canada. And they have multiple um, uh, births and, and, and uh, um, they have multiple brood of, of butterfly along that way, along that path that helps you know, move it along. And one of its pathways is through Oklahoma. And so what we've done here is try to really, you know, you know, get more of that habitat because the numbers are are dropped by 80% in just the last decade alone. I know it's dropped by more than that since I was a kid. And so they're really on a steep, steep decline. And it's, it's pretty frightening that, you know, we could eventually, you know, lose this species yeah. of butterfly. It's really, you know, this is a, an indicator, a flashing red light for us to say something's wrong. Um, and it really comes down to agriculture. I mean, it's the loss of one particular plant, which they can only raise their their young on, and that's the the milkweed plant. And there's several varieties that they eat, but this the wiping out of this plant um, that has kind of really destroyed all their habitat. And um, when we think about you know what used to be here um, on the on the on the tall grass prairie, for example, which you know has abundant you know milkweed in it. Um, that's been plowed under mostly, you know, that in the breadbasket of the world, this has been used to grow monoculture crops. And in those monoculture crops, there, as we know, there's lots of spray, lots of herbicides, which kill that milkweed, lots of pesticides as well, which all affect, you know, that, that death rate on the monarch butterfly. So, you know, it's, it's really critical that we try to get that particular species of plant back so that they have somewhere to kind of raise, raise their, their young on. And, We've, we've planted a lot of it ourselves here on the ranch. We do different behaviors that help stimulate that. And, and the thing that, you know, farmers and ranchers got to understand is this, this isn't a bad, this isn't a weed. I mean, they, they, you know, for years it's been designated a weed and it's not desirable, you know, because cattle won't eat it. 
But what we got to understand is that wheat also contributes to different soil health. It mm-hmm. has its own contribution. And um, nature really understands that, you know, that high diversity is its best way to stay resilient. And when every time we have that extreme diversity in our plant life, that, that's a benefit for your soil health. And then that will eventually be a benefit for your overall health of your cattle and everything else. So it's not should never be categorized as a negative to have these types of weeds. I encourage, you know, weeds because that's typically a flower. And, um, you know, in a monoculture crop, that's not the case. It's like everything is sprayed. No weeds, no flowers. And um, that's really kind of tragic in, in my eye. And I think, you know, as a society, we, we, we get in this mindset that, you know, only these, you know, um, um, crops that look the same or uh, that becomes beautiful. For example, this kind of, I, I, I term it this golf course mentality. Yeah. So when we look at yeah. a golf course, we think, oh, how beautiful is that golf course? You know, it's got everything looks the same. The grass is, you know, a quarter inch high and it's all green and it just looks so beautiful. It's like the worst, you know, toxic waste dump there probably is that absolutely gives no benefit to its environment. And, but in our mind, we think that's beautiful. The same, same time I've heard people say, you know, all these large crops of, of, of uh, soybean or corn, you know, in our mind's eye, everything aligns perfectly, but that's not how nature is. It's, it's, it's made up of mosaics of different things and, and different flowering plants that flower certain times a year and then die and then come back next year. And, and for some people, it's hard to see the beauty in that, but I see it every day and I love it. Um, and I know what benefits it has on on pollinators such as our monarch butterfly. So we we just today on uh, we, we're promoting the monarch through uh, giving away a milkweed seed and and different flowering species of plants to all of our customers. So anyone who orders, we're going to ship a little packet of seed, dependent on what area of the country you're in, and that's going to go with you. And you can plant it in your flower plot. You can you can in your flower garden or plant it in your front yard would be great to me. So um, we hope people will encourage people to think about that and think about the potential loss of this really iconic species of butterfly. And that hopefully it will, you know, you know, educate consumers at at the least. Wow. I'm like literally tearing up. (laughs) I'm like, that's so beautiful. That is so, so beautiful. And I think, man, that that's so much food for thought. I can see that you've thought so deeply on all of these things for a very long time. Cause I'm like, man, like, when did we go wrong? When did we have to have these perfect little plots of land with the white picket fence and the grass and the, then maybe even the fake grass and the, you know, everything is perfectly controlled. And I think we're seeing that now, like we're seeing that at uh, sort of like a, almost like a, uh, you know how people say it gets worse before it gets better. It's almost like at an all time high with the Corona control of the virus. Like we just have very much live in this attitude of wanting to control nature. And it's, it's such a joke because <laughs> you is. can't control something that you don't understand. And the t- real true reality is that none of us completely understand nature or our bodies or, you know, science completely. No one does. And so all we can try to do is, honor it and see and learn from it and mimic it as much as we can in our modern lifestyles. And that's what you guys are doing. And I think that's so, so beautiful with the butterflies. It's like, man, if the butterflies are dying, like, shouldn't that be a pretty big sign for us, for the rest of us? It is the flashing red light that something's wrong. And, and we, you know, we really got to wake up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Our behaviors. So yeah, for sure. I want to ask you, all right. So I'm, uh, I'm listening to this podcast. I'm kind of inspired by it. I'm, you know, Jen from (laughs) Arizona. (laughs) I'm 40 years old and I go into the grocery store to go shopping for my kids, you know, my whole family and, and I'm looking at the meat and there's the regular beef that looks exactly the same as the higher quality stuff. And it's like less than half the price. So could you maybe from your perception, like give some insight on like, what is the difference? Cause we we're just visual. It's like, it looks the same. It looks like the exact same thing. Right. But could you give some of your insight on what would be the difference that people could keep in mind when they're making those choices? Yeah. Um, what's, what's going, what's behind the scenes there? What is the life of that cow and what's the implications on the planet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's huge. And and when I think of conventional agriculture, yeah, they've been very good at getting costs down. They because and the reason that is is because they're so extractive. You know, everything is very extractive. So um, there's nothing. You know, um, it, it's very easy to do when you're that extractive. So 
those cattle uh, conventionally raised, um, yes, they will be in, on grass for the first year of their life, and then they'll go to a feedlot where they'll be in that feedlot for the next 90 plus days, um, fed nothing but a you know strict you know grain, um, potentially just corn diet, and that's not what they're meant to digest, right? So um, a, a rumen is meant to digest grass, and so that begins to you know affect the quality of the fats that's inside that animal. And, and as you know, with grass-fed beef, it is a higher omega-3 um, um, than, uh, than conventional beef and higher CLAs and all these other kind of things that, you know, are, are affect that quality of that meat. Um, it, it may taste good. It may taste the same, may taste a little different, but it's, you know, they've done it um, unfairly in my mind, you know, so they've used these very extractive processes to get it cheap, extremely cheap, mm-hmm. um, and then give that to consumers. So, I think for our own health, we need to be considerate of, you know, what what we're putting in our own bodies and that I would much rather have a grass fed raised on a local ranch that I know where it came from. And I know it had only grass um, or at at least minimal amounts of grain that has been free to roam on pasture. You know, the Mm -hmm. other thing is these giant um, concentrated animal feeding operations where they're packed in very tightly. You know, there's zero blades of grass on that portion of land. And that's just an unhealthy environment. And because it's so unhealthy, they've got to give, you know, lots of antibiotics to these cattle to keep them alive and keep them growing. And, you know, that's all transferred to our own bodies eventually. So um, I'm a big proponent against concentrated animal feeding operations. They have extremely high greenhouse gases. They're destructive on the environment. We're raising monoculture crops to feed to cattle, which doesn't make sense when they can just eat grass. Um, So I'm, I'm totally against that type of system. Um, but back to kind of, you know, why the consumer needs to think about that. Um, uh, um, you, you know, when you, when you raise, when you raise them, like we do, there's so many other net benefits to society. And so, uh, like we've talked about, you know, all the benefits to the soul health and our health, but, you know, so many other net benefits to society on that, that, you know, um, not just with the pollinator habitat, but, you know, just with the health of our own bodies. And I think if, you know, consumers really can see that, that, that difference uh, and be educated on that, they'll choose, you know, a product like ours before they ever would a conventional be. Yeah. Yeah. I always say it's just as selfish as it is selfless because yeah. <laughs> like, while it's really great for the planet, it's really great for the animal. It's also better for you too. It's also selfish. It's not like you're just being some do-gooder of like, I'm just, you know, out of my moral code, like doing the right thing here. It's also selfish. It's also good for you. It does have like, uh, they say up to five times more omega threes in grass fed yes. beef than conventional rays, which should be a major wake up call. Like if, if you understand the body, you know, the, our omega three, omega six ratio is a major indicator of inflammation in our body. Yeah. So these, these cattle who are low in omega threes just show us that they are inflamed they're not healthy and then we're eating those and then you know don't get me started on the keto people who were eating this you know fat is where you store your toxins and we're eating this very fatty meat of these animals that aren't well cared, cared for and I don't mean to scare people but it's just something to consider you know and do your do just do your best for me I know that you know there there have been times when my income's been higher and lower and the times where it's lower I just would rather not eat the meat than buy yeah. The conventional, and of course, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I'm in restaurant situations, and I, yeah. you do your very best. But yeah. on the, you know, when I go to the grocery store, it's like, well, this is all the meat I can afford. That's all the meat I get. <laughs> that's kind of yeah. how I look yeah. at it. Still buy the yeah. better stuff. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I was, I was, uh, um, I'm thinking of another um, thing too. You know, um, when we think about you know, animal welfare and being very humane to our animals. Mm-hmm. There's a difference there too. So um, I think that's important to consumers. So for example, you know, the, the harvest day for us is um, I have a, a processor that's maybe 30 minutes down the road for me. And so harvest day looks like me getting my cattle sleep in the pasture at night. I get them up at 6.30. They're hauled to that processor and within the hour, it's done. So one brief moment in that animal's life and very quick and painless, and it's, it's becoming meat for, for you and other consumers. So just that process can, you know, when we, we contrast that with conventional beef, you know, like I said, it's got to go to these horrible conditions and feedlot for 90 days. 
and then put on a trailer to the processor to wait in line for God knows how long mm-hmm. to be processed. So it's an extremely you know, stressful environment for that animal where I'm literally out of pasture that morning and then they're, you know, they're right. processed that, that ad before that afternoon. So to me, that's just a way more seamless, way more humane process than the conventional beef. So that's, if that's important to you, then, you know, there's another benefit to go local, um, local uh, beef as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, again, beyond, of course, for the animal, of course, that's better, of course. And I'm like, a little bit concerned for our hearts that we that doesn't matter to us. So I'm like, yeah. maybe we all need a field trip to a cattle ranch and to like, really feel this for a second. You know, I think we're yes. very disconnected. I know I grew up super disconnected from my food. Yeah. Like, I used to not eat chicken if it had bones in it when I was a little yeah. girl, because I didn't want to think about it being an animal. I mean, that's how a lot of us were raised and a lot of people continue to feel that way. So I think, you know, having this, we were so disconnected. I know there's people like, um, I don't know if you know, um, Mike Mutzel, Metabolic Mike, have you come across him in the Uh, paleo? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of him, but I don't know him very well. Okay. Yeah. He, I'll have to connect you because he, yeah, you guys would love I, each other, but, um, he, he's big on YouTube and he, he and his family, you know, he shared like killing his own Turkey on his land for his Thanksgiving meal. And he's like, I'm, I'm glad that I have the opportunity to do this because I feel like if I'm going to eat meat, I should be willing to do this, you know? Yes. <laughs> and yes. I just think that's so beautiful. I watched it. I had my kids watch it. I was like, this is what happens. Like, because that, that gratitude comes in, you know, right. instead of like meat just being the same thing as graham crackers is not this, no. <laughs> it's not yeah. the same thing yeah. an animal died for you to be able to eat it so you know i think it's yes. quite sad that we've lost this connection to our food and i'm so grateful there's people like you out there like putting this out like saying hey think about this think about this let's reconnect and i know yeah. you're yeah. you're on the land every day so like i i can only imagine how connected you feel to mother earth. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean that, you know, the day, you know, I've, I've spent their whole life with these animals from the day they were born till I take them to the processor, you know, um, mm-hmm. more than two years later. And yeah, it's kind of a spiritual thing for me really, to be honest, you know, um, you've raised this animal from birth, you've watched it just have a, an amazing life in, you know, these beautiful orch- pecan orchards and, and luscious grass and, and they've had a great and life and then at the at the end they're going to give that back to us and give us more life and i think that's you know what an amazing thing and 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 um it's just how it's done is whether it's kind of this sacred uh thing or if it's just like you know it's just a part of the food system and and it doesn't matter i mean to me that's not it's very kind of a a special thing for me to Mm -hmm. witness at the very end and um knowing that now this this animal is going to you know, give life to many other people and and make them healthier and what it's giving back. And and then it's helped me manage my land in a way that regenerates that soil health. And it's done so much. And I just appreciate, I'm so grateful for that, that Mm -hmm. day that I have to take the crossroad. I'm so grateful and just say a little prayer to myself, you know, about that animal, what he's given to me and my family. So very special. Wow. Beautiful. I mean, that's a perspective everybody needs to hear. I think we're so, you know, we just buy meat in the little packages with the plastic wrap at the store and it's just like a box of whatever. And it's like, man, like, thank you for giving us that perspective. And, um, what a gift, like what, what a gift that these animals are to us. Like, we should be so grateful. Yeah. 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 Wow. What a, what a great perspective. Um, I'm curious, like what your, what your experience is with, Like the movement, you know, we're having, we're having this awareness happen. Like what kind of obstacles? Cause I'm sure this, you haven't taken like the easy route here (laughs) in in ranching, (laughs) right? So like, where do you see us in the shift right now in the world? Like there is this awareness, but from a business perspective, are you still kind of like, yep, I'm going to stick my freaking (laughs) feet in the sand and I'm making a stand here. Or is it starting to become easier to be a more, um, like eco conscious rancher? Like where is, where is that at in your experience? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think with, with this virus that it has shifted consumers behaviors dramatically for sure. And I think what we found out was, you know, how fragile our system is, our food system. Um, and for, for example, um, like 80% of the beef that you buy from a store has come from only four different processors across the nation. 
Wow. So 80 percent of it only goes to four different processors. And there's something like um, twenty two hundred different small processors that like folks that I use um, that make up, you know, the other 20 percent of our beef production. So it's a very, very small amount. And, you know, when one of those big processors goes down, it's it's game over for, you know, the consumer can't get get meat. And then the farmer and rancher, his livestock prices have totally collapsed here lately because they can't get that beef to you know, a processor to get it to to the retail space. And so we realized, man, we have a really fragile system. It just takes one processor to go down and it disrupts the whole country. So I think right now is a like there's never been a better time than to open up this discussion. And and there's never been a better time about human health like you used to talk about every day and how that's connected to nature. And I think that's going to resonate with consumers probably more now than it ever has, Mm -hmm. at least in my lifetime that I'm seeing. And so it's a real opportunity for folks like ourselves, for, for me and for Rep, to kind of be able to tell that story and, and tell why it's important. And people are listening to it. They're more open to hearing it. Um, where before it was just like, eh, my life's fine. Why would I change? Right. But I think they're seeing a drastic difference in why it's important. So, yeah, so it, th- this is as good a time as I've ever seen to, to get a product like ours out there in the, in the public. And they actually are listening to it. Do you have any thoughts for like... Like, say you're a farmer that's doing the conventional raised beef. I mean, I imagine that they feel somewhat stuck in that situation. Do you have any insights on, like, somebody who's in that situation, how they could start to shift without, I mean, there's got to be a certain amount of fear financially and all of that. Like, what? how do you see, um, what do you see needs to happen for these ranchers to, to change if they want to without yeah. having to be scared to death? So there's there's a number of things that are happening, but one of them is, like I said, the livestock prices have at the at the sale barns have collapsed. So mm. no a rancher right now can go to the sale barn and get a fair price for his beef. Mm. It's just not gonna happen. Wow. Um, but when they look at somebody like me who's selling direct to consumer, and I'm saying, hey, look at what mm, I'm doing. I get it. Man, it's working great. Mm. And I do get a fair price and they're like, oh my gosh, well, that's what I want to do. So ah, that, I that see. conversation is so easy right now. And it's right. great. I got and it. I oh, said, you know, cool. Yeah. So, so then that opens up a discussion. Well, how you manage your cattle and how that's different. And then they're, and then they're totally on board when they, if they can see that, Hey, they have an <gasps> outlet for beef, then it's like, oh my gosh, yeah, this, we've got to shift to this. And wow. so the issue right now is it's such a, an overwhelming shift that those 20% of processors that I told you about earlier, they're so overwhelmed, like they can't get their beef in fast enough. Really? So it has been a, just a tectonic shift and, you know, time will tell whether that holds or not, but it's been a, a, an awesome conversation starter here in the, for the last couple months for me personally. Oh, so wow. I, I see a lot of hope in that. Yeah. I get it now. That's so awesome. And that like, that just reiterates even more, how much the power is in the hands of the people right now, because as that demand comes directly from the consumer, from people who are making moves like you selling directly to the consumer, as that demand builds up, that's where the, that's where the energy is going to flow. That's what the renters are like, okay, that's better. That way's better. Oh my gosh. The power is in our hands more now than ever to change this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's, there's also um, a number of things um, related to regenerative agriculture and these methods when it relates to climate change. And so there's a number of things happening there that, you know, potentially, you know, farmers could get paid to switch to these methods for their ecosystem services. So we're seeing a number nice. of, of organizations coming that will actually pay farmers to switch to these methods. So Oof, th- that has okay. a lot of potential as well. I mean, if that does, it'd be game over, man. It'd be an instantaneous, you know, shift to better methods. So if wow. we can keep promoting that that piece of it, then that that will be huge for for this industry. Wow, that is huge. This is like the yeah. most exciting news. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's great because you know we, we you know the the science has shown us that through you know regenerative methods and how you graze cattle, you can store way more carbon in your soils than conventionally done. So um, there's there's many kind of scientific studies out there that that show you can get about three and a half tons per hectare of carbon storage in your soil. So that's CO2 that's pulled out of the atmosphere and put in the soil. And so now people are like, oh my gosh, we've got 
you know, our, our CO2 parts per million today are something like 415 parts per million. To be safe, we need to be, you know, below 350 parts per million. But we see this soil as a solution to potentially pull that CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil as carbon. Wow. And that right. benefits all these other things as well. So all the, the water retention, the water cycle, you know, all these di diversity of plant species, you know, habitat for pollinators and butterflies. And so it has all these wonderful outcomes. It's just, you know, it, but if farmers ever get paid for that, for their services, then it would be a huge game changer. Wow. World, so I, I see that happening, you know, over the next you know few years. Well, this yeah. is just real exciting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My heart is like just beating. So I'm just like, oh, Mother Earth is going to get her healing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. Incredible. Okay. So for somebody who's listening, who's excited about this as I am, like, oh, like, how can they learn more about this? How can they, you know, let's say they want to talk to their family or their friends about this. Like, where do you recommend they start? You know, what, what kind of resources can they find? Where can they get educated? And where can they point people to help them get educated? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely um, I would uh, the, the probably the best um, one that I know of would be at savory.global. Um, so that website has a, a tremendous amount of description and data in it. Um, if, if they like TED Talks, go watch Alan Savory and his TED Talk. Um, another more recent TEDx talk by Bobby Gill from the Savory Institute, who I, I think is the director of operations. Um, so they're really telling that story very, very well. Um, so I would highly recommend, you know, to go watch either one of those TED Talks or just go to the savory.global website and, and learn more about it. Um, because there's it's 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 a ton of information in there, but it's very easy to understand and it really connects with people, I think. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, I'll link all of that in the show. I have watched um, Alan Savory's TED Talk, and that's when I got like just super lit up. I'm like, what can I do? How can I be involved? Like, this is amazing stuff. Um, so I'll link all that in the show notes, and I'll also link to Rep Provision so you guys can check out like what he's what they've made here are these little packs of the grass fed beef sticks and the pecan nut butter, and you dip them in them and and they're made you know if you travel you're doing business you're going to the gym you're just out and about all day it's like a full meal and they're so satisfying because there's so much healthy fat in them and um and probiotics and the beef sticks which is great for your gut health and your immune system and also um pecans have the highest antioxidant capacity of any yes. nut which you filled me in on which i'm like cool and it tastes amazing. Um, like I, <laughs> you know, that I really love you if I share my rep provisions with you. Cause I'm like, yes. my kids are like, can I have some? I'm like, mm -hmm. I mean, I want you to be healthy. All right, fine. <laughs> can have a little bit, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but they're so good. So Thank I'll link you. to rep provisions. You guys can try it. Please try it. Vote with your dollar. Let's, let's make, let's be part of this world shift that's happening. It's right at our fingertips. It can happen so right close. now. But so we, close. It, yeah. if we all play into that, if we all say, hey, guess what? We don't want that other crap anymore. That's where things will change. That's how the change will happen. And that is exciting. That's power in the people. That is like global community collective healing. That is yes. freaking awesome. <laughs> so yes. guys, please yes, absolutely. support. I'll link everything up. And is there any other way that, um, you know, anything else you'd like to leave with everybody before we head well, out? Yeah, I just, I want to make sure people know we will be offering fresh products. So we will be shipping fresh frozen. Um, nice. we, we've successfully shipped from Los Angeles to Virginia. So we, we can get product there. Um, we've got some unique things there. So th those would be fresh frozen product that people can't find it or get it anywhere. It could be an easy drive from our website. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, I'll link that in the notes. Eric, thank you so thank much you. for thank everything you so you're much, doing. Sarah. And for sharing this with us, it's just it's so inspiring. It's one of the most exciting things that I am um, tuned into right now. So thank you That's so awesome. much. Thank you so much, so much. You've been such a, a such a benefit for us. We appreciate you so much. We're so grateful for 